Hello, and welcome to the podcast covering the most dangerous risk of 2024, cybercrime. In our 34th episode of the Crossing Thin Ice podcast series, brought to you by Actuarial Risk Management. My name is Max Rudolph, and as always, I'm joined by Dave Ingram. The leading risk of the 2024 Most Dangerous Risk Survey is cybercrime. This ever-developing and evolving risk surprises with tricks up its sleeve every year and is consistently ranked among the leaders in our survey. It's hard for someone not deep in the weeds 24-7 to keep up. We hope the Crossing Thin Ice podcast series is helping you with your ERM program and risk knowledge. These offerings sometimes look at specific risks, but also consider practical aspects of risk management. Nothing in today's podcast is intended to be investment advice. We're here to provide educational material on ERM topics without getting lost in the technical details. We hope that you will also take advantage of our complimentary quarterly newsletter and webcast on a variety of risk management topics, and also subscribe to our Crossing Thin Ice podcast on Podbean or your favorite podcast provider. Let's get started. Each year, we take greater and greater advantage of the ever-increasing capabilities of computers. However, we find that we are all very much afraid that security over our electronic systems is just not on par with the capabilities of cyber criminals. For 2024, cybercrime was identified as the most dangerous risk after ranking as the number one or the number two risk in all seven years of the study. Cybercrime presents real danger. In the U.S., the FBI reports over $10 billion in losses from cybercrime in 2022 and an annual growth of reported losses of over 30% per year in the five years prior. Cybersecurity spending adds a significant amount to the losses, with one study reporting that over 10% of IT budgets are devoted to security. In early 2023, at least four major insurers suffered data losses through a flaw in a file transfer software that was used by as many as 200 other firms, with over 2.5 million records affected. Ransomware attacks hit several health insurers. In the latest attack of 2023, around 9 million records of an insurer were compromised through malware that entered an unprotected portal and infected clients and partners of the firm that left their door open. In addition, cybercrime presents all of the elements that generate fear. Exposure to cybercrimes is seen as an involuntary activity, especially by businesses like insurers who cannot possibly conduct business without computers connected to the internet internet. People dread the results of cybercrimes where they can suddenly lose access to their data or to a massive data breach and concurrent damage to company reputation. The methods employed by cybercriminals are beyond almost all executives' knowledge, and even with all of the spending on security and encryption and multiple passwords that change frequently, but are stored on sticky notes attached to the, to the computer screen, this all seems to be out of our control. You should listen to our previous podcast, Fear vs. Danger, for more on, on the ways that different risks may promote fear. Insurers and healthcare providers are favored targets because their extensive customer database that is collected for underwriting in insurance and for ad admittance for healthcare. Health insurers are especially damned as they have both insurance and health data. Many insurers will keep files not just of their active customers on their system, but all prior customers, making their exposure many multiples of their current active customer base. Cyber attacks can take the form of emails, also called phishing, ransomware, data breaches, and thefts, which may come at a company through current or former employees, through malicious programs such as malware and viruses, from vendors who ha have access to company systems and networks, or from new flaws in normally useful programs. The cybersecurity spending mentioned above will go towards following recently reviewed and updated cybersecurity policies and procedures for data handling, access control, employee training, and threat awareness, network security, antivirus software, security of employee laptops, data encryption, incident reporting, and response planning, data backup and recovery, as well as vendor security monitoring, 
quite a list. Regular software updates and patches moves from a nice to have to a must have. Cyber insurance now has a major place in the cyber crime mitigation toolkit. In a recent study, 55% of companies responded that they had some form of cyber insurance. Ten years ago, most cyber coverage was provided through other comprehensive insurance policies. As insurers became aware of their liability for cyber coverage, they started to write an exclusion and to offer separate, standalone cyber coverage. While cyber insurance has grown explosively after, over the last ten years, it is expected to keep growing for the foreseeable future at a high rate. Insurers who were early into this market have learned important lessons about underwriting, policy language, pricing, and claims handling that new entrants will need to master quickly if they want a share of this market. Insurers who write multiple lines of business see cyber insurance as particularly attractive if they can manage the business profitably because it will not be correlating to any of their other lines. In addition, insurers are subject to a number of regulations regarding cyber risk and security. In the U.S., most prominent among those are the NAIC Data Security Model Law, which has been adopted by over 20 states as of uh, the time of this talk, and the 2024 SEC Cybersecurity Disclosure Rules for public companies. In Europe, businesses are regulated under the Cybersecurity Act, and by a single body, the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, or ENISA. Businesses are subject to cybersecurity requirements and disclosure requirements of cyber events. In the extent that these regulations actually strengthen cybersecurity in the places with regulations, other places will have higher risk because cyber criminals are not at all sensitive to physical location and can easily shift their focus to places with less effective security practices. And that leads to our conclusion here. Cyber crime will exist as long as there are opportunities that make it profitable for the criminals. As businesses in the most developed countries all adopt more effective cybersecurity practices, activities will shift to other places. And as less developed countries move more and more into modern practices with almost everything being highly connected to computers, the opportunities in those places for cybercrime will grow there until they adopt the most effective cybersecurity practices as well. Cybercrime will be with us for a long time, an endless escalation of attacks and mitigations until the cost of the attacks outweigh the potential benefits. Are you challenged to meet your need for actuaries? Actuarial risk management can help. ARM's Data and Modeling Institute, or DMI, is a team of talented actuaries in Argentina with training and experience, working with an extensive bench of senior consultants. They will partner with you to outsource all or part of your actuarial and modeling needs to the DMI. The best thing? We do this at a significant cost saving to you while still positioning your company for tomorrow's challenges. Contact ARM today about our DMI modeling and valuation services. Max, let me start off by asking you, uh, what do you think puts cyber risk at the top for insurers today? Well, in my mind, cyber is the most important risk where insurers both face the risk and, and they also provide insurance covering the risk. So it makes a a little bit of a hybrid in, in my mind. Cyber is an evolving risk, so there's great need to manage it. And, and insurers can partner with companies and consultants to reduce the exposure, uh, mitigating both the risk and, and the premium. So, so I think there are, are places where insurers and, and brokers too can, can be very helpful. Um, but Dave, I'm, I'm no expert on, on cyber. What did I miss? Uh, you've been spending time on this topic lately. No, I, I, I think you've, you've got it. I, I'm not sure that any of the insurers that are providing cyber insurance are the ones that are saying it's a top risk. Maybe they are because that's a good sales tactic. In other surveys I've seen outside the insurance industry, cyber is, is at the top or near the top of, of any risk surveys that I've seen, and there's a number of them going on. 
and and, and so everybody's worried about cyber and, and i think it's the things that that i pointed out earlier uh, uh which is that cyber fulfills all the characteristics of something that people would have uh, a very large fear of uh, and and uh, so that that's why it's towards the top of the risk in addition to the actual uh danger that that uh, is presented by cyber risk it's that new toy <laughs> new thing to worry about um dave what what advice do you have for insurers looking to to strengthen their own cyber risk management strategies well cyber is seen as is a very exotic risk it's all new stuff always start with fairly simple-minded uh, sort of common sense things. For instance, I always park my car next to a much more expensive car and I lock my doors. Those are very simple things. I, I'm just trying not to make myself an attractive target. That's one story I tell about that. The other story is, is not mine at all, but I've heard it many, many times is the, the story about the two men and the bear. Um, where the, the two men are hiking in the woods, see a bear, and uh, one of them uh, sits down on a rock and changes from his hiking boots to his running sneakers. And the other guy says, what are you doing? You're not going to be able to outrun the bear. And he says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> um, so w with cyber, um, you, you need to make your company uh, a little harder to get into and a little more expensive to get into hope that because of that, the, the criminals will attack somebody else. That means that you can't be trying to do the bare minimum of security, uh, but you don't necessarily need to have the absolute best security, the, the gold-plated version. Uh, you, you don't have to be better than the hackers, but you do have to be better than the other companies uh, that they're trying to attack. And, and you do have to be good enough that that you're inconveniencing the hackers so that they have to do more work they have to take longer to 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 break into uh, your company yeah i like that that strategy of staying under the radar that's effective in a, in a lot of places for me cybercrime is is very confusing i i can buy insurance but i keep the reputation risk anyhow so so the value seems like it may be the the mitigation resources that, that come with the policy. What What is covered? What isn't covered? This all seems to keep changing as, as hackers play, play leapfrog with security experts. Dave, do you think it's worthwhile to even buy insurance at, at this point? Well, I, I think it is, Max, and, and I think you've already hinted at, at the answers as to, to why it is. But uh, I think of there being two answers. Uh, he, even with the the trends, which has been insurers have been uh, making sure that that they can be profitable in this line of business by continually adjusting deductibles, which usually means increasing them, and also decreasing maximum coverages that they're offering. But they're still paying claims. The NAIC uh, publishes every year uh, a report on what kind of claims uh, compared to, to revenues, the loss ratios of this. And the loss ratios on average for the industry are, are moderate for cyber coverage, but they're not zero. So they still are paying significant amounts of the premium, percentage of the premium back as, as claims. So if you do have a real cyber incident, you will face some significant costs to put things back as close to normal as you can. The insurance will help with that. Uh, and, and so it, it fulfills the basic functionality of an insurance policy. You alluded to this, Max, is that I think the insurer will, will, will help, or, or, or maybe you'd call it they'd insist, uh, that you adopt best practices for preparing against cyber events. So with the continual escalation that goes on with cybercrime, there's also uh, a reaction, an escalation of mitigations. And the insurer uh, is likely to know more than you about the latest practices that, that you might adopt. You can think of your insurer as, as a very valuable resource in this regard, and they may help you very much in deciding, well, what new things do I want to or need to do each year? In keeping up that arms race with, with the hackers. Yeah, and it seems like whenever I read something in the newspaper, um, it seems like third-party vendors are, are always involved. Are, are there effective techniques available to protect against those 
third party groups from allowing access to, to my data? How do we force them to be used so that it makes a difference? That is a recurring story. Your impression is is right on, Max. Cyber attack that that get into a, companies that might be them in general well protected uh, are coming through vendors or the portals used by vendors. Uh, last year, there was a a, a number of uh, insurers that had cyber events uh, because of one particular vendor that was infiltrated by uh, hackers, and then the hackers came in with the vendor. I I don't know if insurance companies are all aware of these stories, though. Uh, They should be aware. They need to be aware. They need to then make due diligence of cybersecurity a major item when they're selecting a vendor who will be interacting with their IT systems. So you need to be at least as careful as as we just mentioned, the insurers are going to be with you. So you, you need to make sure that they are doing all those security things that that you're being told to do. In addition, there's a number of common sense. I I always like to relate these things to uh, simple things that we're already doing. I think if you think in terms of uh, security for IT, the same way you think of your building security or your personnel security, uh, many businesses have, in fact, most that I've, I've visited, have a security team. They have somebody sitting at every door their primary role is to manage visitors and to deal with anything quickly that that might happen uh, that involve visitors. So think about that and and think about what you need to do with the IT then. Too often, I think the the business are doing the equivalent of just giving a visitor free reign of your facility. The IT teams need to have a vendor security team, and they need to do the same kind of simple security monitoring and assurance that the, that the guard desk does at most companies. So you need to be checking people in and out. You need to be making sure the doors are closed and locked after somebody goes out, uh, all those kind of things that, that are the simple blocking and tackling of, of security. It's needed in a physical sense with visitors. It's needed in a, in a virtual sense with with your electronic visitors. Insurers have some of the most valuable databases around with personal contact and often financial information as well. One breach, especially if poorly handled, can create so much reputation risk that it dooms a promising business. Phishing, ransomware, and malware are among the terms we all must learn to manage in order to keep the doors of our businesses open tomorrow. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Crossing Thin Ice presented by Actuarial Risk Management. If you find it valuable, please like, subscribe, and share with others interested in learning more about managing tomorrow's risks.